Uh, we come to the uh, seventh chapter of First Corinthians. The different theme altogether from uh, verse one of seven chapter. It's about marriage, and uh, the apostle Paul res is responding here to a letter that he received from the church in Corinth. Uh, if you look at very first verse of seventh chapter. Now for the matters you wrote about. Apparently, uh, they written to the Apostle Paul about sort of questions concerning marriage, relationship between husband and wife, and then after the spouse passes away, is it okay to marry again? What about uh, uh, problems in the family? Should be divorced? Can they separate? Um, issues concerning marriage. So that's a whole chapter is about that. And I think very useful for us to understand and also to be able to counsel, not only apply in our own lives, uh, counsel people who have a problem in their own marriage relationships. So let's go to verse one. Now for the matters he wrote about, it's good for a man not to marry. But since there is so much of immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now what does he say is good for a man not to marry? Later on we'll find, uh, he writes about how, that when you get married, you are concerned about pleasing your wife, which is quite natural. You have to take care of your wife. And uh, it might come in the way of pleasing God. And uh, you are concerned about how to please your wife. Whereas when a person not married, his only concern is to please God. So in a way, uh, in some cases, not always, it could come in the way of your ministry. And we're going to see later on in detail how the Apostle Paul explains Having said that, uh, the Bible also says two is better than one. If you look at Ecclesiastes, fourth chapter, nine and ten, one, one stumbles, other can pull the person up. So husband wife relationship is very, very, very good uh, to uh, support each other, to build up each other. Also, in the book of Proverbs, 27 chapter verse 17, we read, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens the other. So in a family, when husband and wife are both believers, when one of them stumbles, the other can lift up the other person. So two is better than one. And uh, as iron sharpens iron, one sharpens the other. And in the Old Testament, we read, uh, God, after creating Adam, is put in charge of the Garden of Eden to take care of it, to work at it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to work at it and take care of it. And the 18th verse is written, Genesis 2, 18, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll find a helper suitable for him. So he was created. He was created for uh, Adam to be able to do his work as a helper suitable for him, for his work, for to fulfill his calling. So apart from procreation, apart from expansion of the uh, man's, uh, mankind on earth, when you look at uh, Genesis 1.28, it says, after God created Adam and Eve, he told them, the Bible says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful to increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living that moves on the earth. So God gave man dominion over creation. And Adam had to take care of the Garden of Eden and work at it, take care of it. He was the zoologist, botanist, soil conservationist, environmentalist, everything he was. Too much work. And God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll find a helper suitable for him. A helper to fulfill God's purpose. So each spouse is a helper to the other spouse to fulfill God's purpose. Now we know why it's important that marriage should be only among believers. Because then you have different priorities in life. How can you help the other person fulfill God's purpose? So many, very good reasons for people to marry. But here Paul says it's good for a man not to marry. Uh, because there's so much uh, immorality. And even each one has his own wife. Good for, but then uh, because of immorality, it's good to marry. So there are, uh, it's, it's a calling, basically. Later on, we're going to see how to be single is a calling. Paul was single. He was not married. He says only some people can have this gift. So being able to live, remain unmarried and pleasing, please God is a gift of God. So there are a lot of good reasons to get married and reasons also not to get married. Because in that case, 
you are able to devote your full time to pleasing God. Otherwise, your uh, attentions are divided, and you have to take care of your family, take care of uh, uh, the ministry, and therefore it's a it's a calling. Each has a specific calling, and we cannot decide what the calling is for the other person. So it says here, because so much immorality. Each man should have his own wife, each woman her own husband. And the will of God is always one man for one woman. What God has put together, no one should put, put asunder. There are many examples in the Bible about uh, people of God, uh, uh, indulging in polygamy, uh, Solomon, David, so many people. But that's not right before God, very simple. Just because people did that doesn't mean it's right before God. And therefore, it's important that we realize one man for one woman, a man shall his father and mother, be not his wife, two shall become one flesh. What God has put together, no one should put asunder. And God hates divorce. Malachi 2.16 says, God says, I hate divorce. Now, I'm not condemning people who are divorced, but the will of God is very clear. We cannot compromise on God's word. God hates divorce. Let's go on. Verse 3. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, Leviticus, the wife to the husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body doesn't belong to him alone, but also to his wife. So it's a mutual relationship. Both are equal before God. One can't have dominion over the other and say, I'm your uh, husband, I have dominion over you. Wife also has uh, dominion over husband in the context of one flesh. No more two, but one. And it's important that we realize before God, there's no male nor female. Galatians 3.28 There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are one in Christ. Both are important to God. Each one must fulfill his matter duty to his wife, his husband. Similarly, wife to the husband. And they should not deprive each other. Let's next verse we'll see that. Verse 5. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent. And for a time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. In other words, in a sexual relationship, uh, two bodies becoming one in sexual intercourse, don't deprive each other. You belong to other person, other person belongs to you. Don't deprive each other except. Uh, by mutual consent, both should agree that yes, this time we can't be together uh, in terms of a physical relationship because we have to devote ourselves to prayer. Only prayer has priority. And therefore, it's always a mutual consent, mutual understanding between husband and wife. Married life can be very harmonious and peaceful when both discuss together and decide on a win win situation. Not one dominating over the other, husband over the wife, or wife over the husband. But for equal partners, and it's very important that a husband must be considerate towards his wife. In 1 Peter 3 7, we read, Husband, the same be, same be, be considered as they live with the wives. Treat them with respect as weaker partners, and as with you of the gracious gift of life, that nothing will hinder your prayers. When a husband does not treat his wife properly, is not gentle and caring with her, his prayers are hindered. So when you find in a relationship, physical relationship, husband dominates. And he decides when they're going to have sex together, when not. And the wife is a passive partner. And the domination, there's no domination. It has to be mutual consent. Respect their wife's feelings. At certain times of the uh, month or uh, 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 in, in time, then he doesn't feel like being uh, uh, have a sexual intercourse. So you should respect that. So it's always mutual consent to come together and to stay away. Don't deprive each other except by mutual consent to devote yourself to prayer. Both have to pray individually and also pray together. So when you have an understanding of, with each other and love each other with a, with a sacrificial love, then there's perfect harmony. Usually, the physical urges take over uh, um, that uh, the, the divine love that God wants us to manifest towards our spouses. Let's go on. Okay, the reason he says that, 
don't deprive each other except mutual consent for a time. Uh, the devotee shall pray. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self control. Come together again. Because when you don't come together again, you stay away completely, then Satan will try to take advantage of that. That's what's very important that husband and wife should stay together. Not that one person is in one country, other in another country, another city, and uh, you live your own lives for the sake of financial resources. It's not at all advisable. You should never stay separately. Always be together. Otherwise, what will happen is Satan will take advantage of the fact that you're alone and tempt you with all kinds of sensual temptations in the mind and also uh, in the emotions. And, uh, and if you lack self-control, by the way, self-control, the Greek word for self-control is agratia, which actually means control of the self. And who controls the self? You should let the Holy Spirit control the self. That's why this is one of the uh, qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit has nine qualities, nine characteristics. Galatians 5, 20 23. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. If self control is the act of the self, then it's not a fruit of the Spirit, not part of the fruit of the Spirit. Self control means control of the self. Who controls the self? The Holy Spirit must control the self. So it's very important that when you are Holy Spirit control the self, then you cannot get tempted by certain schemes. So here Paul writes and said, don't deprive each other except by mutual consent for prayer. Then come together again. You won't be tempted by, uh, don't get, uh, what is it? Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Verse 6, I say this as a con concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am. But each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, other, another has that. I wish all of you were like, well, like me, as I am. What was he? He was a bachelor. Paul never got married. And not being married and being able to exercise self-control is a gift. Everyone doesn't have it. And uh, uh, when, when, you, when you're not married and you're living alone, it's important that you depend upon the Holy Spirit to uh, control the self, control the mind, because the mind is what makes the body do what the body does. So Paul has a gift of his abnormally born, and he didn't get married. And we're going to see next verse how he says he didn't get married. He's unmarried. And interestingly, it's wonderful to know, even though he's not married, he wrote so much about the married life. So many uh, in the letters of Paul to Colossians, Ephesians, that's because his ministry was by the Holy Spirit. Even though he was not married, he advised people on marriage. Because that teaching actually came from the Holy Spirit. He was taught by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. I'd like someone to read a passage, no, not a passage, a particular verse. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Could someone read? Nick, you, you got your co-host, right? Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Anyone who gets it can read it. Galatians 1.11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. Next verse also. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. So whatever Paul wrote, whatever Paul uh, preached, came by revelation from Christ. So even though he was not married, he could write about marriage because that came from the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit takes from Jesus and makes known to us. So that's why we find so much of wisdom uh, in Paul's letters, because that wisdom came from the Lord himself. So he wrote about marriage, and he was until not married. But he could write about marriage because he also, I believe, must have had the experience of um, uh, meeting people, married people, counseling people, and learning from their experience. And all of us have that 
opportunity of uh, learning from other people's experiences. Verse 8. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it's good for them to stay unmarried as I am. So Paul was unmarried. Many Bible scholars, uh, they say that Paul was uh, married because uh, according to tradition, he was part of the uh, Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. How they came to know about that, I don't know. It doesn't say in the Bible. And to be a member of the ruling council, you must be at least 30 years old and married. You should be a married person and age, at least age, age of 30. And they thought he was a uh, 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 member of the Jewish ruling council when he was a Pharisee. But then here he says, I'm unmarried. So that's that uh, theory doesn't hold good. Ultimately, our reference point for knowing the truth is the Bible. And he said, I wish all of you were I am. Ahmed and the widows, I wish you were uh, as, as I was, and good for me them to stay unmarried as I am. But, verse, verse 9, if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Better to marry than to burn with passion. So the passion can be manifested in the body through the sinful nature and starting with the mind. Like Jesus said, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, it's come to adultery in the heart. Adultery in the heart, not in actions. Looking at a woman lustfully is committing adultery. And that will lead to a passionate desire to have other person, whoever it is. Now, the Bible talks about two kinds of people. One are people who have eyes of adultery. Second Peter 2.14. Eyes of adultery. These are ungod ungodly people. They never stop sinning with eyes of adultery. That's what we should not be. What we should be is what the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2. Treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Pure eyes. We can have either lustful eyes, eyes of adultery, or pure eyes. The question of whether we give our eyes, our mind, our heart, everything to the Lord to be used by Him. So it's possible to look at a lady who is beautiful, but not lustfully, rather with pure eyes. We are asked God for those pure eyes, purity of eyes, uh, and, and then, then we are on the safe ground. So Paul writes about that. He had this gift of being unmarried and not being lustful because he had, I believe, pure eyes. And we all can have that. Whatever the Apostle Paul wrote, he lived it, he practiced it. So he talks about uh, uh, having pure eyes, looking at women with eyes of purity. He must have been like that. That's why you write with, with confidence. So being unmarried and not being lustful is a gift of God. And you should ask God for the gift. And everything that is pleasing to God, when you ask, he will surely give. Let's go on. Better to marry them to burn with passion. Being unmarried and having passionate desire and lust is not pleasing to God. And therefore, better to marry than to burn with passion. Marriage only with one person. Verse 10. So the married I give this command. Not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried. Or else be reconciled to her husband. The husband must not divorce his wife. Now here, it talks about separate, separation. A wife must not separate from a husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried. So the, the God's will is, his, uh, by the way, the word will of God, often I share with you, means uh, telma in Greek, which means desire of God, the wish of God. Wish of God is husband and wife do not separate. And the word for separation is Koristenai, Koristenai. It means leave. Don't leave your husband. But you have to leave your husband, be a woman unmarried. Don't divorce. Divorce is a set them away. The word for divorce uh, is a word called Afianai. Afianai. It means to let them go permanently. 
to let a person go away, send her away, send the man away. That is divorce. Legally divorcing. But here it says, you should not separate. Don't leave your husband. But if you happen to leave your husband for some reason, then don't get married again and don't divorce. Now, there are examples in the in contemporary world of many husbands uh, actually using violence, domestic violence on the wives. Even the church, it happens. And in such cases, I believe it's okay for women to separate, stay separately till such time he changes. No point sitting in the house and getting beating all the time and encouraging your husband to beat you. No, it's not acceptable. Totally against 1 Peter 3.7. I like someone did again, first, first Peter 3 7. And how different it is from husbands today in the churches. Could someone read first Peter 3 7 again? Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. And treat them with respect as a weaker partner. Husbands, and in as the same heirs, way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. The prayers of husbands are hindered when they don't treat the wife properly. Can you imagine a husband using violence against a wife? In such cases, I believe, as I mentioned here, that woman can leave her husband, not divorce, not send him away. Divorce is sending away. Whereas, uh, uh, live separately till such time he repents. And he, there it's important for the church to, uh, to be involved in that and uh, ensure that they are reconciled. Look at the next verse. It says here very clearly, if she does, she must uh, remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and husband must not divorce his wife. Reconciliation is always possible because that's the nature of God, bringing about reconciliation. There's no problem between husband and wife that can't be solved when both are humble, teachable, and look to God for guidance. God is the God of reconciliation and peace. So if there's a love for God, every relationship can be mended. And God gives us the resources the spirit and the word to bring about reconciliation. So we need people who can be instruments of reconciliation. You know, last night only I spoke about that last uh, night and also Tuesday on uh, uh, backsliders, how to restore backsliders and uh, how to be a people of who bring peace within families, reconciliation. So uh, there's no question of divorce. And I said earlier, Malachi 2.16, God says, I hate divorce. So when you find a husband not treating you properly, leave him for some time. Stay separately, maybe in a parent's place somewhere. Don't get mad again. Don't divorce. And hope that God will change that person. And the will of God, you reconcile. And don't please consider divorce because God hates divorce. I'm not condemning people who are divorced. I'm not passing judgment, but I'm only quoting from the scriptures. If you love God, you won't consider something that God hates. Living separately is okay, but not a permanent divorce. It's like any other disobedience to God. I'm not condemning people, like I said, but we have to be faithful to what God says in his word. And please do your best for reconciliation. And therefore, there are many verses that talk about uh, reconciliation. And you can give some references. You can later on read it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Romans 12, 18, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. So, reconciliation is always possible. And as much as possible, people around the couple who are having a problem between them should be instruments of reconciliation rather than separation. And definitely don't be a party to divorce. I've seen many examples of people have problems who come back together again, reconcile. And what recently one case there is about a person who was actually divorced then became a believer and then wanted, uh, ultimately wants to get remarried now. It's a wonderful thing to get remarried because you made a mistake and God put you together. Don't go ascender. And uh, as long as you do, want to do something called the will of God, 
is always help available. Counsel and wisdom will be available to bring about reconciliation. He says here in verse uh, 10, To mad, I give you the command, not I, but the Lord. That means the Lord is speaking to Paul to tell them that. Then he goes on to say in verse uh, 17, To rest I say this, I, not the Lord. What he's saying is, I'm saying from my own. I'm not saying God told me to tell you. He is honest about it. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer, is willing to live with him, he must not do so. Oh, and if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and is willing to live with him, with her, she must not divorce him. He says, I am saying not Lord. I am not saying God will tell you. But he goes on to say later on, I think I have the spirit. In a way, he's being sarcastic. He knew he has the Holy Spirit within him. But he spoke from his own spirit. He said, I am saying not the Lord. You consider it. In other words, what I am saying, you consider it. And whether right or wrong before God, ultimately, whatever we hear people say, any uh, man of God or woman of God, always get the confirmation of the Holy Spirit if it's from God or not, if it's, you have to do it or not. And the people may say from their own spirit, it could be right. It could be, in, it could be in keeping with the spirit of God's word, in which case you accept it. So Paul is saying very clearly, I'm saying not the Lord, I'm not telling God told me to tell you, but I'm saying this. When any brother has a wife who is not a believer, Willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. Divorce is out of question. She's not a believer, but uh, she's willing, willing to live with you. And woman has a husband who is not a believer, he's willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. Look at verse 14, which I'm going to explain more uh, elaborately on Monday. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her husband. Otherwise, the children will be unclean as it is, they are holy. Unbelieving spouse is sanctified to the believing spouse, other spouse. And uh, there's no time now. I'll elaborate that on Monday. It's a wonderful verse. It's for people who, at the time of marriage, were not believers. Then one of them becomes a believer. Of course, he can't divorce his wife now because he's an unbeliever. But this promise is there. Since you are a believer now, a believing husband sanctifies the wife, believing wife sanctifies the husband. So don't divorce. God brings the spouse to you because now you come to know the Lord after your marriage. Once you're married, no question of divorce. But then what do you do with unbelieving spouse? This promise is there for them. So I'll carry on on Monday. On the, I'll elaborate again on verse 14. And it's wonderful to know this passive, beautiful chapter this is. A recipe for a biblical successful marriage. God bless you all. And we'll meet again on Monday. And in the meantime, read the whole chapter on, of, uh, on seven chapter of Corinthians, first Corinthians, and understand, better understanding we'll have of marriage and relationships when you meet on Monday. God bless you all. Mm -hmm.